computer. Yes. Right, so do I do I have to do anything? No. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with 40 and for your people across the United States. Did you know that most small businesses lose $27 million per year on bad HR, but comes out to an average of $10,000 per employee, or that, or that small business owners waste 25% of their time on HR? Cabinets HR focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is David Stepania. David, are you ready to be great today? Yes, sir. David is a co-founder and CEO of Thirsty Sprout, a hiring marketplace for specialized remote engineering talent. David has over 10 years of experience in business development in high-tech industries. He grew his last business, Data Micro, which sold Cisco products from $0 to over $20 million in three years. He has acquired customers from Fortune 500 companies, including FedEx, and Avnet, Progressive, and UPS. In the first incarnation of Thirsty Sprout, he linked partnerships with WeWork's entrepreneurial community and built engineering teams for companies like Rover.com, other venture funded startups. David, thank you for doing this today. Thank you for having me here. So David, let's talk about your background real fast. You're from Georgia, correct? Yes. And not the state, the country. The country, yeah. A lot of people get get that wrong. So what is it, so what is it like growing up there? And Georgia, for those who don't know geography, that Georgia is like right next to, the, to Russia, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, we, we used to be part of uh, USSR. Um, and in 1991, we broke off. We had a war. Uh, I, was, uh, I was there during that time. And then, uh, you know, at some point in 1994, I moved away to Slovenia. Um, I lived there for a few years. I followed my uh, brother to the United States. He was a professional in basketball here playing for the Seattle Supersonics. Um, and then in 1998, was it 1998? Or no, actually it was like 2000. I forget what exact year, but I, I went back to Georgia and uh, another war broke out between Russia and, uh, and Georgia. It was last about three days. Uh, I guess I was lucky enough to have been there in some way. And, uh, just, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm still here. I'm alive. And I think things are good. So what's the name of the territory that Russia took away from Georgia? The Ossetia, something like that? Yeah, Ossetia uh, and Abkhazia. Abkhazia was in 1991. Uh, and Ossetia is the most recent one. And so... I mean, I'm not, you know, a political expert, but in, in many ways, Russia does it to kind of destabilize the region so that we don't, uh, so that the United States doesn't come in there and build, you know, uh, military bases, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of ironic. So when I was in the Army, when I made major in the Army, they sent to, to a school called Fort Majors. Mm -hmm. It's a year-long school in Fort Livermore, Kansas. And our case there for the whole year was the, the Georgia War. From, so we studied that for the whole year, right? Mm -hmm. Like the political stuff. So it's pretty interesting. So I didn't know your, your brother played basketball, though. Yeah, he's about seven feet tall. Uh, and he was one of the first players to, uh, to make it. Or, he, yeah, he was the first player out of Republic of Georgia to make it into the NBA. And he played for the Supersonics the whole time? Uh, played here for two years. Played uh, for Miami for two or three years. And played for Portland Trade Blazers for about two years. And he's seven foot tall? So I mean, tall. you're pretty tall yourself, right? Yeah, six six. So, yeah, you're, you're, I mean, not you're. <laughs> not as tall, but yeah, he's uh, he got the tall genes in my family. That's pretty tall. So when you moved from Georgia to the states, how old were you? Uh, from Georgia to well, I moved from Slovenia to states, uh, but I was 14 years old. And I bet that had to be a culture shock. Yeah, because I moved from you know a, a city or from two cities, you know, I lived in Tbilisi before I, I moved to Slovenia, uh, to Slovenia. And then from Slovenia, I moved to uh, Chesterton. And Chesterton is about a city of uh, about 5,000 people in Indiana. 
Um, I mean, just Indiana in general. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's crazy. You know, like I came from like a, you know, city that had, you know, a few hundred thousand people population or in Tbilisi it's like over a million, um, to Chesterton, which had like 5,000 and everyone listened to country music. You know, there wasn't like too much to do other than like yeah, play wanna, sports yeah, or go, or go <laughs> in the farmland or be yeah. down probably. Yeah. And everyone's all about high school sports, like basketball. And that's the reason like I, why I was sent there is to play basketball. And it's a good way to focus, you know, like it's a good way to, uh, you know, focus on school and sports and also be part of a good community for the most part. Like, like everyone's all about, you know, the, uh, uh, having a good community, et cetera, et cetera. And, and yeah, I mean, for, for a year I was, I enjoyed it in some ways. I missed, you know, my home at the time, but then, you know, after moving back to Seattle, I, I got exposed to the city. Things were a little bit better, but now that I think about it, I sometimes I miss, you know, Indiana as well. Yeah. Cause you definitely focus less to do either you focus yeah. you got to do or what else you're going to do. Right. There's, yeah, no, yeah. there's no distraction, so to speak. Right. Right. But yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. They're all about sports. We had to run around the dunes i don't know if you know like what that's all about but like it was tough uh, you know like they they pushed us to our limits and until we were like you know puking sorry for it <laughs> that's fine <laughs> but, but but yeah it's it's it, it it gave me a good taste of true america i would say <laughs> that's very true indiana's yeah yeah true america yeah that's where i learned to eat steak you know, there's, it was, it was a, I'm yeah. sure there's a lot of steak and potatoes. <laughs> oh yeah. Lots, lots of barbecue and grilling. So David, how many languages do you speak? Uh, so because of moving around this much, uh, you know, I was born, uh, to a Georgian father and a Russian mother. And, you know, I learned both of those, uh, growing up, uh, as a third language, my mom enrolled me into a, a into, a, you know, a, program with a German tutor so I learned German actually because I, I studied for about you know 11 years or more so I was fluent at some point uh, besides that I also learned Slovenian and Croatian um, and now English right so uh, about six and you, are you are you like pretty much fluent in all of them or you, or you just get by in most of them now uh, so, so you know uh, Russian Georgian English I'm fluent Slovenian, I used to be fluent. Now I'm a little rusty. And German, I used to be fluent. Now I'm also probably a little bit rusty. So if I go back there, I, I can probably pick it up within a week or two. That's usually what happens when I go back. Yeah, so let's talk about Seattle for a minute. You know, everyone knows what's going on in Seattle, you know. How, how has Seattle treated you as far as, like, your, your business? Has it been as far as the startup community, tech community, and everything going on, you know? Uh, Seattle was good. Uh, for the most part, uh, you know, before Seattle, I was living in in Hawaii for three years, and I came back to Seattle for that specific reason: is to grow my this current venture. And so far, you know, Seattle has some uh, drawbacks to the startup community. I would say, as like you know, the, a lot of the founders aren't as. Uh, involved in the startup community as they are for example in san francisco or some other uh you know like maybe new york boston but i'm i'm i think that's changing a little bit and hopefully for the better but for the most part you know we've we've done okay we've gotten we've, we've gotten exposed to uh you know some big companies and for the most part you know it's it's good place to be in yeah, it's definitely, yeah, Seattle's definitely a good place to be in versus some other places, right? Yeah. But one thing, a lot of people say, like, we got to be in San Francisco. Like, well, you're never going to catch San Francisco, right? Because they have such a head start mm -hmm. and you even want to be the Bay Area. But I, yeah, it's some of the difficulties, like, in my, and this is my opinion. I can't see how there's all these verticals, right? There's like Startup Grind, Founders Live, you know, all these different verticals. It's like they never like intermingle. Like they're always staying in vertical and, and don't do stuff with other people, you know? Yeah, yeah, so I think yeah. it's a challenge. Yeah, so it's it's more about like getting the 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 old successful founders that succeeded with their startups back into the startup community. For some 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 reason, they kind of drift away. Where versus in other cities, they kind of like jump back into the into the scene, right? So that's the only drawback I would say, and I think it's like a lot of people would agree with that one. 
But other than that, I, you know, like I said, there's so many promising companies here. It's just like it, it just takes a little more effort, you know, uh, connecting with them. Yeah, like people, I don't think people realize how many AR, VR startups are here in the Seattle area. I mean, this mm -hmm. is like one of the big big points for that in this area. People don't mm -hmm. realize how many they are here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of a uh, lot of interesting startups. Uh, I think if you know S Seattle is more focused on like the enterprise level startups, you know, like uh, you know, like it, it's you know the things that interest investors here are, are the next Amazon or the next Microsoft versus you know in San Francisco. I think you have more like consumer driven uh, apps that have worked out really well. For example, like I don't know, you know, Airbnb or you know, like Uber, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good point because I went to the Bay Area like a couple of months ago and I was talking to someone there, a VC investor I was talking to. I was talking about, you know, how San Francisco versus Seattle, how Seattle's hard, it's hard to get funding, all that kind of stuff. And he had two theories I thought made sense. One theory was like in, in the Bay Area, he said like most startup founders, when they like quote unquote make it, get acquired, have millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. He said, we use all of them invest the money back in the stock communities in mm -hmm. San Francisco. He said, as far as you knew in Seattle, when someone made it quote unquote, they don't really invest it. So I don't know if that's true or not. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's definitely. And I think that's one of the big issues here right now is like I said, like, you know, once someone succeeds, they kind of like drift off and you, you may never see them again. Um, and I think Seattle, I mean, this is my personal opinion, but you know, like people don't come to Seattle for startups. People come here for high paying jobs at Microsoft and Amazon and whatever else like be Facebook or whoever else has the office here. And then you don't have that passion of people of hungry people coming like they do to San Francisco and giving them the capital and the tools in order for them to kind of like succeed in that startup environment, you know, be that how, 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 you know, no matter how difficult it is, at least they have that opportunity in Seattle. That opportunity is, is, not as good and so that's the only downside i would say but you know there's others uh, there's other ways to kind of like reach your goals if you're a startup so uh you just kind of like you know need to adjust your strategy and like you know like what you're building and who you're building it for and then at the end of the day you know like now with this pandemic everything's becoming more remote more global so i think you know it doesn't really matter where you are people from san francisco are moving away to idaho you know <laughs> because it's a lot cheaper to live there so so we don't know what's gonna happen in the next like 12 to 16 or 18 months right because the world is shifting yeah and then my vc friend hit another theory too um he used to like in, in san francisco all the investors there had been former startup founders right they knew the community they knew what's been entrepreneur where it said in seattle all the investors are more like people from Amazon, Microsoft. So they never, never really had a startup, right? Those are the right. enterprise, which goes to your point of Seattle's more enterprise focused on startups, which mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then often like what I'll hear is like, you know, I mean, in Seattle, you almost, what, what they're looking for is not take on any risk almost. And yeah, I, they I want you to have a startup that's working well, that has paying clients, and it just needs a little extra capital to fuel the fire, basically. Like, yeah, right? I, I like to say, my opinion again, I like to say in Seattle, they, they like you to have like a, they're more like a small business banker versus an investor. Right. right. And they want you to be like, have a series metrics at right. the PC, right? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is always like frustrating. Yeah, so that's, the, that's the, you know, that's, that's kind of sums up the story, I guess, of Seattle. So Yeah, uh, but one thing I would definitely tell people like, you know, you know, try, if you're in Seattle, try to raise money in Seattle, but don't forget about the Bay Area, Austin, Boston, because how, to imagine, how many companies do you think try to raise money in Seattle until no, and they just stopped, right, and quit because they did, either didn't know or didn't think about going somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I have one client that, you know, was turned down here in Seattle, like very, you know, you know, like, you know, someone with a very good, great background in finance and, you know, no one really wanted to, no VC wanted to invest in his startup here. He went out to San Francisco. He had a lot of success um, raising initial capital. And just now he uh, wrapped up his Series A for $8 million, a company named Giraff. Yeah, I hear so many stories about like that, you know. Yeah, so in, in San Francisco, they're just a lot more open to risk. I mean, they're smart about it, but 
you know i think uh if you have an idea if, if you're more at an idea stage and you have a good team i think san francisco may be the sometimes the right place to be definitely so i gotta go turn this camera back on it went off for some reason all right So at Thursday Sprout, y'all do hire, remote hiring for developers. Mm -hmm. How do you vet these developers? I mean, because I mean, obviously you can't bring them for in-person whiteboard tests. You know, they're in different countries, different nations. How do you like? Uh, so, so in a nutshell, you know, you need, you know, three things for a developer to be successful in, in, in a remote position, right? They need to have the technical aptitude to do the job. They need to have good communication skills and then good discipline uh, or otherwise, you know, like, you know, your time management skills. So those are like the three key things that we look for. Uh, and oftentimes essentially like what, you know, that entails me, it, you know, like some of, some of it can only be achieved by your experience. Uh, you know, like it needs, you need to showcase that you, you know, worked for at least three years with other companies in a remote setting and you've done it successfully, right? Uh, sometimes we take a not, you know, take a chance on someone who's excellent at, you know, in their technical abilities and their communication skills, but has mostly worked in an office and things have worked out. Um, other times, you know, we've had a case where they've done great, great on their technical tests and their communication is great, but they're just cultured, fit and their you know time management was off and for some reason because of that they weren't able to succeed in the position and sometimes that's because you know they're afraid of uh, speaking up if they see an issue and uh, other times it's because they can't manage their time uh, you know efficiently and they're just kind of fall off the project basically. And the, you know, the velocity of the, how fast the project moves, uh, falls. So the developers, they're working with your customers one-on-one, -on -one, right? So if you have a developer who doesn't have any people skills or are not responsive, that makes your company look bad, right? So yeah, I'm sure you got to do a really good job of vetting these people and making sure they're good match with your customers. Yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, my partner, uh, in my company is an ex Amazon engineer. Uh, my other partner at the company, he's a CTO of, a several or you know the, was a cto of a couple of tech companies one of them that went through white combinator uh, raised over 50 million dollars and now he heads up indeed uh incubator so we have the right people to vet these developers out on the technical level um and as far as the communication goes you know like that's pretty you know straightforward um as far as their time management, that one is probably like the trickiest one. And the only way we've, you know, figured out how to crack that code is to kind of like go back to their previous hiring managers and talk to them about how they've done in their previous work. So developers, do all of them have the same technical skills? Or you have, are you like all over the place as far as like tech skills for your people? No, I mean, so, you know, we have, there's a certain uh, level they need to meet in order to pass our interview. Uh, but the skill set varies. Some of them have, you know, three years uh, experience and they do great. They pass, but it's, you know, it may not compare to someone who has worked for 10 plus years and, you know, he has a wider uh, skill set and, you know, when it comes to the technical aspect. So David, I love how you have your price on, on your website, right? I just, I mean, I just love that, right? I mean, so many companies are like, call us or, you know, I just don't like that. And of course, I'm sure you can negotiate, maybe get higher with a case, but why mm -hmm. did you decide to put your prices on the website? Uh, so simple, you know, one of the simple reasons is because like people, you know, like we, we have specific countries that we hire from and those specific countries have, you know, cost, you know, cost of living associated with them. And so 
in certain countries, you can get an amazing developer for $40 an hour. And that same developer in the United States is going to cost, you know, $180 an hour. Um, so we want to be transparent about where we source our developers from. And we want our pricing page to kind of like dictate like, you know, the pricing ranges for, for those developers in those countries, because oftentimes customers in U S don't know like how much an, you know, developer should get paid in Mongolia or wherever he might be. As of right now, we don't have any developers in Mongolia, but for example, we have a developer in New Zealand and otherwise, you know, like we want to be uh, a trusted partner for companies to turn to, to figure out like what's a fair price to pay for a quality developer in say Eastern Europe or Latin America. So how do you find developers? Are you actively recruiting or do developers come to you by word of mouth? Uh, so multiple ways, uh, actively recruiting is one of them. Uh, partnering with companies that have access to large networks of developers, be that, you know, uh, shared spaces in other countries, uh, or, you know, some partners at various accelerators. Uh, so we have just a, a, a bunch of different sources that we, uh, utilize and track to see which ones, you know, deliver the most quality. When a, a customer comes to you, is there a minimum number of hours they have to do a product with you? Like they have to like commit to like, you no know, 30, 40, hundred hours or certain price, price range. It depends. Uh, you know, like <laughs> it depends if like my friend comes to me and says, Hey, you know, like I had, I, I need this little bug fix or whatnot. You know, maybe I'll ask one of our developers to take care of it. But ideally we, bet out our clients just as much as we bet out our developers. And so the reason for that is because we want to set our clients up for success. Oftentimes, uh, you know, some clients will go turn to say Upwork or another platform thinking they need a one-off developer, but really uh, what their project needs is a project manager, backend and a front-end developer. And so we want to be, you know, we want to be the, the company that they can, you know, turn to, to, uh, build the right team for their startup and whatever that may be. So how do you vet your customers? Cause I'm a big believer. Every customer is not a good customer, right? Like how do you go about doing that? If someone comes to you, has this great idea. Uh, so, so there's two things, um, you know, in, in some way, um, I've taken, you know, I've taken a customer who wasn't the most, you know, where we had to sacrifice a, a lot on price and cost and because I believed in, in their product and it has worked out well. Uh, one of them just now uh, raised venture capital funding and they're scaling our team to over four developers. Uh, other times, you know, I would say... The easiest way to vet out, you know, a, a bad customer is oftentimes in this business is to work with someone who's not technical and who's not responsive to uh, any kind of feedback. And uh, the issue with that is, you know, like it, it's kind of, it's the, the interest doesn't really align because oftentimes they they'll see that the price in say India for developer is $3 an hour and they think that they can build their app for, you know, a thousand dollars. But, it, and oftentimes it's, it's very hard to communicate with a customer like that. Um, and so that's kind of like, you know, like what we oftentimes look for is a customer who has a technical co-founder and who knows what he wants and who we can work with uh, to build the right, you know, team for, uh, for whatever that price range might be. So I know uh, there's a lot of VCs who will say that if you're a tech company, they're not going to fund you if you like outsource development. And you know, other tech people like, you know, do we we'll do what do you can to build MVP and we'll worry about internal tech later. What's your opinion on that? It depends on the setting. And then that's like, I, I'm a big believer in that as well. Um, but like I said, like, you know, for example, our, 
our current company that we that I just spoke about that raised money, they didn't have a technical co-founder. Uh, they had a technical advisor, and their technical co-founder, I mean, you know, the the person that came to their meetings to raise money was one of our developers. Uh, he worked directly with our developers as if uh, the developer was his his own. We were just kind of like handling, you know, uh, kind of like you know some consulting on who should be on the team and like what would that you know like what would the successful team look like. And so he was able to get by without a problem. I think oftentimes what doesn't work is a non-technical co-founder who doesn't have the right team and who just wants some you know solution built. And oftentimes, you know, he outsources his idea to some dev shop wherever else in the world. And the dev shop does whatever they can for as little as they can to make as much profit as possible. And when that happens, uh, what the customer ends up having is a solution that doesn't scale, doesn't work. Um, and you have, you know, an MVP where, you know, like your runway, like your financial runway has come to an end and there's not much you can do with it because you're just kind of like stuck with like a very minimal viable product uh, and you can't really do much pivoting uh, with it. And that's the, you know, that's the benefit of having a technical co-founder is like when you reach a point of running out of cash, if the technical co-founder really believes in your product, he can get you, you know, maybe another six months or a year uh, runway, right? And so if you don't have that, and if you outsource this whole solution somewhere, and you didn't, you know, you didn't work directly with the developers, you just work with, you know, the project manager who's, goal is to, like I said, to make the most profit for a dev shop, that's where you might find yourself in trouble. David, can you talk about technical debt and what that is? And so technical debt, is that responsibility of the CTO tech team or is that responsibility of the CEO? And what is it? Um, technical debt, you know, it's essentially making the wrong choices, wrong technical choices and having to pay for them later down the, down the road. And so uh, I think maybe there may be some wrong, con you know, some, some wrong connections of technical debt to uh, the dev shops for that specific reason I just spoke about earlier, which is, you know, like if you outsource just like one solution to, you know, with very light oversight to some dev shop, you know, who knows where, uh, what will happen is they'll take the, easiest pathway to achieving your goal uh, and sacrifice a lot of quality to get you what you want immediately. Uh, and so they can generate the most amount of profit. And that oftentimes leads companies into whatever, you know, solution was outsourced into, you know, expanding onto, into their technical debt. Otherwise, every company has technical debt. Sometimes companies themselves have to make, you know, choices uh, to ship something faster and then figure out how to pay down the technical debt later. I mean, about 70% of, I think 60 or 70% of development at bigger companies goes towards maintaining existing uh, features. It doesn't actually go towards building new features. And so companies are always looking to improve that process to kind of like, you know, uh, focus more on, on shipping new features instead of just maintaining old code. But it's, it's hard to kind of like escape all technical debt, I would say. So let's fix a little bit. Let's talk about business development. You're pretty successful as a business development person. What are some keys to be successful in business development? Um, I like to think being honest, uh, you know, doing what you say you're going to do and being transparent. Yeah. Is, is the way to go. Um, but you know, persistency and consist consistency is obviously at the top of the list as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just so many different ways. I guess we can take that conversation if there's like some specific. No, just, <laughs> just in general. Yeah. 
Um, but, but yeah, that's it. I mean, knowing your market, knowing who you're selling to and like what, what, you know, like what problem you're selling for, for, for them and doing it, you know, honestly and transparently is the way to go. I would say, um, putting this, it's a lot of work. It's like, you know, <laughs> uh, a lot of dedication. You gotta, I think one thing that helps me going is, is I, I truly want to help people succeed. And I believe in what I do and it helps me push uh, day in and day out. Uh, because otherwise, if you're just kind of doing it just for purely for the money, and I'm sure, you know, like you, you know, like there's plenty of positions like that. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, you, it's, it's to me, it's, it's, there's has to be some passion element for it to be successful yes. in business development. So, in a startup, whether you're like your startup founder or doing business development in a startup, how important is is to get used to hearing the word no all the time? Um, yeah, it's 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 important to not just hear it, but figure out like why why you're hearing these no's, right? But in some ways, like I've been, you know, I've, to me, no doesn't really mean much, as in like you know, like you don't want to take offense to it. Uh, you want to figure out how to a overcome it, and you know, like like I said, like initially, like you need to know like why you're getting a lot of no's if that's the case, right? Um, and you want to kind of like have a percentage where you're getting sixty percent yes and like you know thirty or forty percent no. Uh, and is it is it the price that's the objection? You have to figure out like what's the issue with with the no, but what's like is there a specific uh case that you want to point out as far as like no no time. no i mean it's, i just wonder you're gonna hear no all the time right and you can't and too many people i think take it personal right yeah yeah you don't want to take that personally you just kind of have to have your vision and keep mo moving forward towards that vision there's you know not not you know your solution might not right it might not be the right fit for everyone but uh it's gonna be the right fit for plenty of fish out there so talk about WeWork Labs. Thirsty Sprouts a member of the WeWork Labs Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. So what what have you gained from being in WeWork Labs, and how have you been able to utilize that that community, so to speak, to help yourself and Thirsty Sprout? So I think WeWork Labs, like, is is great because before this, you know, I've joined WeWork, like, you know, as just like a member at like a different location, and I've also tried out a different. Uh, shared space and what was really missing is like a, a sense of community where you can you know you know talk to someone at, you know next door or at next desk or whatnot who's also working on a startup and may have some experience that you may be missing and he can help you out on uh you you know with his mentorship um his or her mentorship and that in that regard it has worked out great and you know like i said uh we work with several companies from we work labs and you know they've been happy and that's i think that's what it's all about it's about having that startup community that's all driven towards you know the same same goal which is in some way improving the world via technology or hardware or you know food or whatever else yeah what i like about we work Labs seattle is like i know I was there for six months, my own company. And like, there was always like something going on, right? Mm -hmm. Some kind of, some, something like, you know, expert. And then like flying fish was up there. Right. Grub sticks is up there. Mm -hmm. There's always something going on. I know they used to do like this weekly huddle where we're coming. Like I need help with this. Yeah. So I just like the community. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great resource, I think. Yeah, no. Yeah. In that regard, it was also great. Lots of events, lots of food. Uh, I was, yeah, it was, it was good for probably gain a few pounds, but. <laughs> and then also people realized that WeWork Labs is actually across the world, right? Because I know the Slack channels are like different WeWork Labs across the world are the same Slack channels. You can reach out to people across the world with help or, you know, all that kind of stuff too, which I think is really nice. Yeah, no, the community is great. Like I said, it's like, it's, you know, there's some good mentorship. Um, there's, you know, like I said, like a lot of successful uh start uh, not successful like, you know a lot of uh startups that are led by successful entrepreneurs or you know what i think will be successful entrepreneurs based on their career tracks and 
previous jobs and whatnot. So yeah, and just the level of expertise of startup founders up there. And you know, I can only talk for the one here in Seattle we were collapsed when I was there. Just the expertise of people there, the stuff they're doing, like, whoa, like you're like you're borderline genius, right? Right, right. Yeah. 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 So David, talk about your own entrepreneur journey. Like why become an entrepreneur? Why startups? Um, so in some way, like I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but then, you know, I went to college, uh, in college, I was doing entrepreneurial things, I would say, <laughs> but you know, after college, I actually joined a, you know, a commercial real estate company. One of, one of, I think the, the biggest commercial real estate investment company called Marcus and Millichap. And this was at, at, you know, 2007 or eight uh recession uh during the 2000, 2000 2008 recession and the whole company just kind of like fell not, not fell apart i mean they're still around they're still one of the biggest but like my my manager quit he started his own thing uh all the other partners just kind of like ventured off into their own thing and but our floor was basically empty and so i decided to kind of like look, decided to look into tech. And one of the interviews that I lined up for myself was, you know, for a company called Centurion, uh, which was an offshoot or like was, was a entity that used to be part of uh, Siemens. And it's like a, you know, $60 billion company, uh, electronics company. And there, when I got the job, I was heading up their business development efforts for all of North America. And I was working directly under, uh, you know, uh, the VP of sales for uh, North and Latin America. And, you know, he was probably one of the top sales guys I've ever um, met. And I wouldn't say sales guys, like like I said, like he was a VP, you know, much higher than that. But, um, I, based on his background, I also learned that, you know, like in order to succeed in, in this position, it's like you didn't need, you know, too much knowledge or too much like expertise in, in tech or engineering or this or that. Um, and so after working there for a year, we, um, you know, a, a friend approached me with a, with, a, with a business venture, which was, you know, Data Micro. Uh, he found a partner in, in China who had a contract with Cisco and they needed, you know, a, a, an office, that, you know, here in, in Seattle. And so we opened that up for them. Uh, we became partners in, in, in this new business venture and we took the company from having an empty office with no chairs, nothing to having our first shipment of Cisco come in from China into a public storage of all places. And we literally shipped them by, by our hands and acquired the first few customers. And to me, it just, it felt great. It felt great. Like, you know, doing something that had, you know, just like, you know, like a, just an idea on the paper and taking that from zero to like I said, like $20 million in revenue and like in, in year three, uh, hiring new people, creating jobs, like, you know, you know, like kind of executing on our vision. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, or I mean, I guess I haven't talked about this, but I, you know, the business actually was doing so, so great. At one point I was able to work remotely. We kind of like had all our systems optimized, you know, automated and so i moved to hawaii to do my, to my do my job from there at some point in in this like venture like cisco came up with a policy that cut out certain you know distributors and one of them was us and they did this by uh telling the said distributors that you know the serial numbers for this specific country need to be from you know like either mexico or here but not from china and so we weren't able to source uh uh, source product anymore, uh, or as much product. And so our revenues dipped. So we ended up shutting the business down, uh, which slowly kind of like, you know, created an opportunity for me to explore other ventures. Right. And so that's kind of like what brought me to Thirsty Sprout. But before Thirsty Sprout, 
you know, I also invested in a couple other startup ideas with a few friends and they didn't work out well. Like we outsourced to some, in, you know, some chop shop in India. Uh, you know, we made mistakes of our own. Uh, our, you know, our documents were, or our, you know, our scope was loosely documented. So they didn't know what they were working on. We just had some ideas. And after about you know hundred thousand dollars that I wasted on on these ideas, I decided there's got to be a better way to uh, you know find source you know quality talent, the same kind of talent that works at Amazon or you know Facebook. There's available like you know in other countries that doesn't really have access to you know to startups that need it most here in the U.S. Uh, quality development for you know quality price and so um, that's kind of like what I ventured out to do I started Thirst Sprout with another engineer and since then we've had some shifts and changes but like now we have a core uh, group of teams uh, that's very strong and we're expanding and we're again doing what we love i think we're like executing executing on our startup vision sometimes uh things take a little longer than this business you know like we we had about like one quiet year when we were starting up but then we you know landed our first big client which is rover here uh in seattle and we partnered with we work labs uh, like I said, like one of our other startups just raised Series A. Another startup just got backed by uh, a, a venture capital fund. So we've done some good things, some good achievements in, in like pretty short period of time in this kind of a business. And now we're on to our next um, miles or not milestone, but our next, you know, yeah, I would say milestone, which is creating a platform out of our business. And that's kind of like what we're working on now. You have a good point. I think so many, and I had to learn this lesson myself. So many entrepreneurs don't realize how slow the process is, right? Everyone thinks, oh, oh I'm going to be, you know, a millionaire in six months, right? They don't understand the process. So first of all, being an entrepreneur is not easy, right? Everything has to line up, right? And everyone has to have your same drive. So many things to go wrong to knock you off, right? Yeah. So everything has, to, everything has to line up and it usually doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And then you make a good point about remote work. So I'm interested, it's from HR point, I'm interested to see what happens to all this over with. Like, all, all these companies gonna say, hey, hey, Jason, you know, Corona's over, come back to work, right? And with the building, I'm like, okay, so let me get this right. You want me to drive an hour to work, mm -hmm. stay in a queue for eight hours and drive back home. Mm -hmm. When I prove when I can like work from home, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's an interesting dynamic. And I'll follow up on that. So recently I've been doing a lot of Zoom pictures in the Bay Area, right? Mm -hmm. And all, all the VC have said, you know, right? If this coronavirus were here, we'd never done a Zoom pitch, right? We'd have made all you come in person to San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. And then made it this open up a whole new, like a whole new level of people we can talk to, right? Because how these people wouldn't even come to the Bay Area, right? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's what we're like, you know, like what we're banking on is, is the fact that like, you know, like the world has changed, you know, 70% um, of developers or engineers don't want to give go back to work or maybe not just developers, but just like workforce in general. Um, the other 30% wants to go back to work, but like, you know, now I think this creates an opportunity for companies that, um, that only hired on site to open up to remote work. And that's kind of like what we're thinking. Big enterprise companies are now going to be more uh, friendly or, you know, more open to hiring um, engineers or teams uh, remotely. And so that's kind of like why we're doing what we're doing. We want to build a platform that quickly allows them to log in and find talent that's available for the, you know, vetted and available to do uh, remote development because not all developers are meant to succeed in a remote position. Some people just kind of like, cave in after you know a month or two of being uh you know stuck in a room so they have, they have too much freedom so to speak yeah or they have too much freedom and they can't you know organize their time etc cetera, etc cetera. we want to uh we we just want to have a platform that just you know essentially cuts down on bad hires 
um, and which can cost a lot of money. A lot of money uh, can be wasted on, on, on bad development. I mean, we talked about technical debt. Like if you hire, you know, uh, you know, a developer that's not, you know, technically gifted and whatnot, not only are you losing time, which is, you know, you can't get back, but you're also losing hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? David, so for your point of view, what makes, what characteristics or values make someone to be a successful startup founder? Uh, I would say grit is one of them, definitely. Um, and you just have to, I, I think like one of the biggest things is, is like, you have to be open to, you know, going through a lot of pain, I would say, uncertainty and pain. And you have to have a capacity to handle that pain, right? Because there's going to be just times where like, like you have a choice. It's like, you know, for, for right now, you know, I don't have a family or kids yet. I have a girlfriend and I have, you know, like my, my brother and my mom, my brother, I have enough. But if I had kids at some point, you know, like kids or, you know, wife, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, the choice is, is tough, right? Like you have your family and this is the oftentimes that, the, you know, like the sacrifices the star founders have to make or are facing is like, this is either your startup or like your family. So like you pick which one do you want, you know? And so as, as if you're, you know, like if you're young and you're like, you don't have, you know, like, family yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I think you're in a position where you can make that sacrifice. You can, you know, spend six, you know, 16 hours a day, just uh, either working on your startup or thinking about your startup and the other eight hours you go to sleep. Right. <laughs> but that's not always the case as you know, for, for all people, some, some have mortgages, big, big mortgages, big college expense, you know, so, so I would say it just, it depends, like, you know, it's like, it depends how much, like, again, pain you can take on as a, as a founder, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, you make a good point. Like I say all the time, like, if you're married, your spouse has to be like over 100% committed. Like, that, that, your spouse has to be on board, right? Your spouse can say, oh, uh, you know, do what you want, you know, oh, whatever. They have to be like fully on board, right? Because, because like I say all the time, you probably quit your job at Amazon, so you're making less money. Mm -hmm. And not only let's make less money, you're spending money you don't even have on the startup, right? And so if your spouse is not fully on board, it's, I think it's really hard for you to succeed. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's 100%. That's, and I've heard so many cases uh, of that happening where, you know, like they had to make that tough choice, like whether they work on their startup or, you know, they you know, work on their family uh, matters, right? And so, but that's not only the case in, you know, for, you know, like for, you know, married founders but for example you know a cto or whoever not part of the startup has to make those same choices like you get either paid you know like sixty thousand plus equity at this startup or like your choice is like go to amazon and make almost half a million dollars right and so it's a tough choice when you know those kind of uh numbers and choices that you have as a startup founder especially in the technical background and in, in the technical setting so you know the the problem again is, is is time you could spend three five you know oftentimes like you you do need to make that you know five to ten year commitment to your startup oftentimes right and like if five years go by and you make no money and your startup doesn't succeed i mean the cost you know opportunity cost of that is that you know you could have probably retired by now if especially you Seattle, Amazon you know, or facebook like, <laughs> yeah because you know because i draw your i draw your startup's gonna fail right because like right. So, like you said you gotta really have a passion for what you're doing right, right and then so you follow that passion of three or four years and like network at amazon where you know at amazon you make it for four or five years you want to set for life you know that's a big opportunity cost so you really gotta have the passion for it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah no exactly you have to have a passion for it and 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 yeah that's that's about it You're like that's where the grit and pain and suffering all comes all together it's like how badly do you want it 
So, David, you talked about this a little bit, but can you go to more detail of your, of your vision for Thirsty Sprout? Like, where do you see Thirsty Sprout being like five, 10 years? Like, is, is it going to come to you as a platform everyone comes to for software tech talent or? Uh, so, yes. I mean, like, we've been kind of like discussing that ourselves between me and my co founders. Like, like, what are we trying to do as a business? It's like, do we focus on, you know, kind of like more individualized approach where we work with like few select clients and just like do a great work or like, like do we become more of a product company? And we decided to kind of like start shifting while we do have, you know, like the initial almost like consulting sort of an arrangement with many of our clients. Like we want to become more of a product company. And um, that's why we set out to build a, you know, a, a platform, a hiring marketplace. And so um, ideally, like it's, it's going to be very simple. We want to talk to companies that are hiring developers and they want quality vetted talent. And all we, we're going to ask these companies to do is go into our platform and set a filter to the specific skill set that they're looking for in the specific vertical and Essentially, like, you know, week after week, they'll get, you know, matched with vetted talent for their position that they're looking to fill. And so that, that's a lot more scalable than building custom teams for uh, startups, which, like I said, like I've enjoyed. But like, I think now is the opportunity to kind of like work with companies uh, who are going to be expanding into their remote hiring goals. And so that's kind of like what we decided to do. We're going to have something launch here in a month or two, I think. So Dave, you talk about this too, but what do non-technical founders get wrong about tech? Like, they, they, like I don't think a lot of, like a lot of tech people, oh, here's my idea. It, uh, my idea is going to actually go from my, my, from my brain to your brain. You know, every little thing I need, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just like so many things that <laughs> it's just like, it's hard to, I, I guess it depends on like the technical level of the non-technical founder right like for example i was in some ways like i've sold technical solutions all my life but like when it came to engineering like i was still not very you know like not very technical like when someone would tell me like oh yeah you know like when i would talk to some founders or like some you know ctos or this or that like and they would say oh this make you know this would this will take like 300 to five hundred thousand dollars to build and i'm like well it's just you know like I'm just trying to test the water series. So like, where am I, where am I supposed to find $500,000? Yeah, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, I'm just trying to build an MVP. <laughs> yeah. So, and, but then I realized it's like, you know, like what they're saying makes total sense now. Like, you know, now that I've learned, like, you know, working through various like startups, you know, like working with various startups, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that sort of thing makes sense. But then, that doesn't mean that something that costs five hundred thousand dollars to build can be figured out how to be built or like how to you know where you can build an MVP to test your idea. Sometimes for as little as like a few hundred bucks by building a landing page and driving some traffic to it. And so and that's oftentimes kind of like you know if someone comes to me and they're at a very idea stage of their startup, they don't really know their industry. They just have an idea of like what they want. And there's ways to test that idea. And some of it can be as little as like a few hundred bucks. And some of it, you know, like, or at the very worst, you know, like you can put together a product for, you know, 15 to $30,000 and that's what you're risking. In some way, this, in, in some way, this is kind of like, you know, like, like the stock market. You have, you know, like you, you see how much risk you can take on and you look at like what the opportunity uh, if you succeed of uh, you know, like what that is going to turn into, right? Like you, you'll risk $15,000 to get accepted to an accelerator who's going to give you a hundred thousand dollars. And if you do that, that's like a bet worth taking, right? But you need to know enough about your business to be making those kind of decisions. And oftentimes like, you know, their startup founders come to me and they're like, Oh, I have this idea. And like, they don't, they just like, you know, like they, they see someone can, you know, like put slap something together in, you know, like some country like India for like $5,000 and they think, oh, this is, 
something that's same as, you know, like Dropbox or Facebook, but like if you could build Facebook for $5,000 or Uber for 5,000, like everyone would build, <laughs> build, build these things. Right. So it would, and they wouldn't pay engineers half a million dollars to, to, you know, like to work on a, like, you know, microscopic task of the entire company. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like I tell people all the time when I do a bunker labs, it's like, you got to tell people about your idea, right? And your, and your spouse, your best friend doesn't count, right? You got to go tell strangers. And there's right. like so many people, and I'm sure you see so many people have this great idea. It was going to buy it. And like, okay, are you sure about that? You know, and then, then you're just wasting your money, wasting people's times, you know, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely got to brand it, I think. Yeah, first is like you got to tell as many people as possible and see if like if it's something that they'd want to use or not as many. Like you can start with you know, ten. Like if you have ten close business connections for whom you're trying to solve a problem, um, tell them. If you're if it's a consumer app, then tell to as many targeted demographic people like in that de demographic as as you can. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. So let's go back to you being from Georgia. So being from Georgia, you're pretty much what would be considered an immigrant in the United States. And a lot of people say, and I agree, that being an immigrant is actually an advantage to being an entrepreneur because you have more drive. I mean, the most famous one I know is Gary Vee, right? From Belarus, you know, mm -hmm. talk about his story, all he has. From your point of view, does being an immigrant give you like more focus and more drive versus like, we'll say, a regular American? I, I think it does. It, it, it does. I, mean, I have the odd upbringing where I like, I... Like I said, like I went to 11 different schools. So in some ways, like, you know, like academics was a little bit like tough for me, even though I went to, like I said, like, you know, University of Washington, this and that, like, and that's kind of like, that's my, my, I guess my drive. Um, I just, I wanted to get like a degree here from the United States and I still want to pursue like an MBA. Um, but it came at a very high cost for me. Like, you know, between like class, between the ages of, you know, six to 10, like I didn't really even have like a textbook. I just, my, my mom just sent me to, oh, okay, like go to this school, just like, just to get out of the country. Uh, and I would just kind of like attend classes, not really learn much. Then I would like, you know, my mom would try to homeschool me on the weekends and I'd fly, fly back to Georgia to take the exams, pass the class. So I did whatever it took to get the job done. And I think that's kind of like what the, you know, like the grit that like oftentimes the kids are missing, uh, who are oftentimes given everything they want. And, you know, like oftentimes they just kind of like get by with, with whatever life gives them whereas like if you come here and you're hungry to try and try and get things done um i mean it's just yeah it's just like it, you can't teach that i don't think or maybe you can maybe that's like when we were talking about indiana running the dunes until you puke i mean that's like, <laughs> like welcome to america it's like i haven't had to do that <laughs> in in europe so it's, it's different like you know like i think in the united states you are provided opportunities to develop that hunger and and grit and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i can't just say that it's like oh you know just because you're an immigrant like you have more uh you know like more hunger because i mean there's like i played sports here i mean there's plenty, plenty, plenty of like hungry guys like that like get after it so <laughs> So, yeah. so I don't know. It's, it's a weird uh, dynamic, right? Like, I don't know how, how you can measure, like, you know, like how bad someone wants them. Yeah. I mean, do you have, you don't like, you know, Kobe Bryant, his focus, Michael Jordan, his focus, legendary, right? Yeah. But, I mean, do you have it? Is it tight? Like, yeah, that's a good question. Like, is it no, what's it with oh, environment versus, you know, skill, you know, I think it's a question that will never, never be answered. Yeah. Cause there's plenty of lazy guys in my country. I can tell you that much. And, you know like latin america or like whatever like wherever you look there's plenty of places like, i think that's like same everywhere right um i would say it's like also depends on your surroundings which makes like you know like i said like we work is a great place you are surrounded by other hungry guys that want to succeed in a startup environment so i would always say or we actually just talked about talked talked about this with my partner um 
good is the enemy of great. You know, there's times when our, like, or now like our business is going good and we can get complacent or we can create, we can do something that will, you know, like that will uh, push us harder. And so just like yesterday, we decided to do, for example, you know, my partner picked up a high performing journal that we fill out every day and we'll try to kind of like outdo each other on goals, right? Like, so you want to be in a competitive environment and where that is, like which country uh, doesn't, I don't think that matters too much. So how do you deal with this? You know, like you're pretty driven, pretty, pretty driven, pretty focused. How do you deal with people on your team or just in life in general who are like make excuses or not as driven, always take shortcuts. Do you just say, okay, that's the way it is. And I can't do anything about it. Or you try to like motivate them or you just say, you know what we have, or do you say we have different backgrounds and it is what it is. Yeah. I've been, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big problem. Like excuses. It's like, it's, it's like a huge, huge problem. And I think sometimes if you have, you know, like if, if, if you don't have like that high performing job background that you came from, uh, you know, like you can develop that excuses personality, so to say, um, and, you know, I've, I've worked with a few developers who needed a little, uh, you know, push in their back um, and how to overcome it. I'm, I mean, I, I think as, as a leader, you have to find how, you know, find different ways. I mean, there's books I read on how to kind of like how to people manage, how to inspire others, how to, you know, like figure out like what drives them forward to, uh, see that you know like which buttons need to be pressed in order to get us to the moving into the right direction so i can't really say there's like one specific way but you know like i think these are the skills you develop as a leader over time and there's ways to refine those those skill sets and there's many different ways many different books that you can kind of like read on about so dave this is my point of view it's like an I know here in the Seattle area, it seems like if you're like a, a mid-level or senior developer, it's like you just go from job to job, no problem getting a job. Mm-hmm. But if you're a junior developer, graduate from college or coding academy, they have a hard time finding a job as a junior right. developer. What advice do you have for junior developers to find their first job? Uh, so two things. Uh, I would say the reason oftentimes why junior developers get passed on is you know, because a lot of time goes into coaching them before they become self-sustainable on their own. And so there's two ways to overcome that. It's like you either go to a company that will provide you and has the funding to provide you with that mentorship. And usually that's a big company uh, to, you know, help you grow as a developer. or the other uh, way is, you know, while whatever, you know, job you have, uh, you kind of like build up a portfolio of, of your own projects, which showcases your uh, drive towards, you know, showing your potential future clients or employee, em- employers that you have a drive to work independently and figure out problems on your own. Because that's oftentimes the issue with junior developers is like they get stuck and they can't, you know, like after they get stuck, they can't really move forward without guidance or help from others. And oftentimes if, you, if it's a small company, you don't have the right resources to accommodate a junior developer. So as a junior developer, like you have to showcase, show, show that you have the initiative to work independently and there's a few different ways of going about it. Like I said, or a couple of different ways of going about it. It's like you either develop your own portfolio, show, you know, show that, you know, show your next boss or employer or like startup that uh, you take the initiative into learning new skills and improving your skill sets outside of your job. And then there's the other side of that, which is like you just work with a bigger company that has the budget uh, to support you for a year or two before you learn and can work independently. I know, and this is my opinion, I think a lot of new developers have the attitude, 
oh, I've done a six month coding academy. I'm ready to take on the world, right? And in reality, they probably don't know a little about software development, right? They still have a lot to learn. Yeah, from what I'm like, you know, from what I'm hearing for like hiring managers, it's like that, you know, only like a very small percentage of them works successfully in a new job, right? But like I said, like, again, like you need to place yourself in a successful situation for, you know, to be successful in your job. And so oftentimes it's like you need to find the right uh, job match for yourself and, you know, a company that will help you grow. And like you said, most companies are going to hire you if they need to train you, right? They're going to expect you to go day one and perform. Most companies are going to say, hey, we have a budget to train you for six months, right? I just, uh, yeah, I mean, like, there's companies that have that budget, right? Like, to, to train you. And, like, oftentimes startups that are, like, that need to move really fast. And they need to, uh, you know, they need to control their spending aren't going to invest in training junior developers. And so that's, that's, and it's, it's, I would say it's like, you know, it's a potential, you know, recipe for disaster. If you, if you, I guess, join a startup where you kind of like get overlooked for it as far as like training goes and you can't really. So I think both like, you know, like both tech companies and, you know, boot campers kind of like, maybe know that or maybe if they don't like that's my advice to them is to kind of like work on your portfolio independently of whatever job it is you're doing and showcase that you can take a project uh end to end ship something so Um, so do you recommend a new developer try to get a job at a startup or or a big company or it just depends on his situation his other situation yeah, I mean, like, yeah, it just depends. Yeah, big companies usually have the resources and the budget to train you or, uh, you know, like you have to kind of like make up for it by, you know, building products in your spare time and showcase that you can take without help from others uh, that you're able to ship a product uh, from, you know, initial concept to completion. So follow up question, talk about new developers. How about the developers out there? Been they're, they're like the mid-level senior level developers. Well, they're like quote unquote. We'll say they were stuck, right? They they had the same job. They can't get promoted, and they can't do anything else, right? What do you put advice you have for them? Like to try to jump, start, like like pose their like senior developers. They want to become a CTO or VP of, of development. I mean, they want to go to the next level. What advice you have for them? Um, I'm. I'm not, you know, like I'm, I'm not an expert on this matter, like, you know, in corporate USA, but like oftentimes I know, you know, like you can do really well on interviews if you really prepare for them, prepare for them well. Uh, and if you land a job at like, you know, Amazon or like Facebook, even if, or not, you know, if you land a job at Facebook or Google, you're probably set, but you can land good jobs by just preparing well for the interview. And after, you know, getting some experience at like a, at like a company, like a fan company, for example, like anyone will hire you. So, uh, it's probably okay to switch positions and in order to, uh, grow is my advice and how that's done. Uh, I, I can't really, you know, like how, how you do that. Like I can't really okay. provide guidance. On so let's say change the subject again. So you do a lot of traveling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Talk about some of your like favorite travel destinations. And is this something you always done your whole life? Travel a lot. I mean, not travel a lot, but I mean, you, I mean, you do a lot of posts on social media, different places you go. I think you were in Mexico a little while ago, different places you go to. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I love to travel. I, I would say there's probably people that travel a lot more than me, but like for me, like I love the coast, man. I, I love like California coast. I, uh, I love, you know, Oregon coast, Washington's coast is okay too. But for some reason, it's just like, like a lot sunnier down, you know, further South you go. So I like sun. Uh, but yeah, like I said, like I, I, I enjoy ocean. So that's why I also lived uh, in Hawaii for, you know, like three years and I kind of missed that. And so Seattle has some, you know, you know, like it has, you know, Puget Sound, all of that, but it's, it's not the same as like the kind of ocean where you can go and, you know, like surf or like, you know, 
uh, I don't know, it's just different feel for like, you know, like more tropical weather. Is, is, is yeah, I know in Seattle, it's like what the change July 14th. And the joke is that it's still the month of January, right? Yeah, I mean, like until yesterday, it just felt like it was winter. So I think we've only been to <laughs> 75 degrees, like four times since April, something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, for me, like travel is important. Yeah. Um, so that's how you get your break, so to speak. Yeah. That's I also get... like pick my cities based on like the kind of like if they have good food, like I'm definitely on my interest, you know, like <laughs> Texas, one place I haven't been, I'm really trying to go to. They have like, you know, the Texas barbecue. I still haven't had an experience. I've been to Dallas, but I just flew through there. So I was only there for a day, but I want to check out Austin, uh, you know, other other cities down there as well. Yes. So David, talk about why HR is important to a small business or startup. Oh, HR. Like which part of the HR recruiting, managing? That's a great question. You'd be surprised how many people I go to, you know, about Kevin's HR, they're like, we don't, we're not hiring or yeah. we're not doing this specific thing. Yeah, that's a good point. HR is so expensive, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there's just like so many different, like, you know, recruiting, like right now we're just trying to, come up with a scalable solution that gives us a clear overview where our best candidates are coming from so that we can expand into those spaces and like trying to pick which solutions to use for our applicant tracker tra tracking, et cetera, et cetera. For the most part, we've gotten by with like word of mouth and referrals. And that's how we built out like a database of candidates. But now what, like you know, now that we're decided to build a platform, like we're looking to, uh, reach out to hundreds of thousands of developers and like we need something there. How, do you, how do you manage that right like yeah how like you know like do we spam them like are they yeah. gonna get pissed off about that like i'm not sure I, mean, I guess we're in some way like we're still a startup so we're just gonna be testing it uh and then how do we manage all of that like how do we create like onboarding for them how do we uh you know how do we make sure uh how do we make sure you know, we're just set legally uh, in every country that we do hire, right? And so right now, luckily in some way, you know, like we aren't focused in hiring in US just yet as much or at all. And, you know, HR is a lot, you know, less strict than some of these countries. And not because like, you know, like not, not because that like, you know, we have some HR issues, but it's just like here, if you make some like an HR mistake, like it could cost you a big lawsuit, right? Like, I mean, I, you tell me like, <laughs> so that's why we're kind of like staying away from, yeah. you know, like. And even the States, like, you know, it, HR, HR is different through the location, not to talk politics, but usually if you're like a, from a democratic state, mm -hmm. it's more laws, like, you know, like New York, California, Washington has way more laws. Mm -hmm. And states are considered like, quote unquote, conservative, like right. Texas, Idaho has way, way less laws, right? You know, mm -hmm. so politics play a lot, big part of it too, I think. Yeah. So right now we're trying to keep it like very simple. Like we have like, you know, like our onboarding for any, you know, like, you know, payment processes set up for each countries that we do business develop or like, not, or we do business in. And, you know, the HR laws there are, not too crazy like you know we just need to work you know they need to have an established business set up uh in order to work as a contractor in most countries and that's like that we provide guidance for that but here in the u.s there's just so many more laws where like you know like if someone works more than this hours and technically they're your employee then like then there's like you have like pay benefits like and if you don't like you know all hell could break lose uh whereas versus in other countries like they just care like what's the hourly rate that they get paid for and like they don't care about benefits they don't care about like you know time off like give them more work like they'll yeah. do more and it charge so much perception too right oh i perceive my, my boss treating me unfairly right you know, right right perception has a lot to do with the two yeah and like you know things like discrimination things like that isn't as I mean, it's it's probably like a big problem in those countries, but not in the kind in the way we do our business, right? Like we, like uh, you know, like we have, uh, we're pretty inclusive. We have like you know female developers. We have like developers of various you know like backgrounds and ethnical uh, uh, ethnical backgrounds, and you know developers from all different countries, right? So uh, to me, like. 
those those things you know like i feel like sometimes in us it's like some people are out to kind of get you and so in other countries that you don't have as much like you know legal companies trying to sue you just because like you you know created like a wrong onboarding doc or whatnot so yeah like i like i, I like to say you know hr and hr like people are your best resource however comma people also suck too right 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 so for example like you know like my partner who works at indeed um you know and he runs their incubator all of his emails before they go out are checked literally checked by a by a lawyer because hr is just such a huge there's so many legalities here in us attached to hr right uh and so for that reason for right now we're kind of like staying clear from you know doing business in the us because you can maybe get in trouble quickly so and then for that regard i mean that's like where your service comes in handy right because <laughs> Yeah, this camera keeps on turning off for some reason. I gotta oh, figure that out. It hasn't done that before. So David, I understand you have a gift for our listeners. I have a gift for it. For our listeners. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, for anyone that's looking to do any kind of software development or just, you know, uh, you know, looking to build the next product or just like expand their team, like we'll be happy to take off 10% from, uh, our hourly rate for anyone that's, you know, like I said, looking to either scale up their startup or looking to launch their MVP or whatnot. Um, so that's, that's our gift to our listeners, I guess. And uh, yeah, reach out and happy to discuss, even if it's just, uh, just a discussion. So David, can you see your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Um, yeah, I can be found on LinkedIn. Uh, like you can check my, uh, uh, find me under my name, David Stepanian, and Facebook, same thing. Uh, David Stepanian, Stepanian, those are the two things that I probably check the most. Uh, and you can always reach me by my email, which is david at thirstysprout.com. And for our listener, we will have the, the link to his gift and his social media on, on our show notes. And you can find the show notes at www.cabinethlblog.com and be sure to share this uh, episode with your friends and your network. So David, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Um, any advice? Uh, stay strong. I mean, we're living in a, in a odd time because of this pandemic and, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs are, uh, ex like burning out because of, you know, isolation or whatnot. And just um, my advice is stay strong, reach out to your peers and, you know, find other ways to connect if it's not in person. Um, but yeah, that's, that's about it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for your time, David. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day. <laughs>